huge thank you to the entire Octacon team who have done a fantastic job over the last couple of weeks and months. Uh, and you can see uh, from the pure uh, quality of panels and participants and workshops that we've had. So I just want to take a bit of a moment if we can just do a quick Bula Boss, uh, just a quick applause. Thank you very much for everyone for all the fantastic work. Fair play to you. So um, yeah, just to introduce myself, my name is Damien Larkin. I'm an Irish military science fiction author of Big Red and um, Blood Red Sand. Uh, I am also a co-founder of the British and Irish writing community and our online magazine, Bard of the Isles. And I'm proud to say that this is my third Octacon and it's fantastic to be here. So just as I um, can see is on my panel, or sorry, on my screen, we're just gonna go around. Um, we're just gonna go around one by one. If you can, uh, everyone just give me a very brief introduction to yourself and to your works, and then we'll dive into some of the questions that we have. So Remco, I'm gonna ask you to start off there, please. Okay, so I'm uh, Renko von Straten, and I write heroic fantasy and horror with Angeline Adams. Uh, earlier this year, we published our uh, collection of uh, heroic fantasy stories. It's called The Red Man and Others. And we are very excited that in a couple of weeks' time, our story of ours will come out in um, a collection called Beyond the Veil. Vale and it's from Flame Tree Press. So that's right in time for Halloween. Brilliant, well done, that's fantastic to hear. Juliette McKenna, if you'd like to tell us a little bit about yourself and your works, please. Oh, um, I am uh, started out writing epic fantasy. My first novels were published in 1999. So I've been doing this a while. Um, 15 epic fantasy novels, uh, latterly a lot of uh, short stories, novellas, going into different things. Latterly, I'm writing contemporary fantasy. Uh, not urban fantasy, but rural fantasy, drawing on myths and folklore from the countryside. Uh, newest book, Green Man's Challenge, just out this week. Um, people are enjoying it. Um, and yeah, so that's me. Brilliant. Cheers. Thank you very much, Juliet. Uh, Joe Zebedee, if you'd like to tell us a little bit about yourself, please. Hi, uh, so I'm a science fiction and fantasy writer from the frozen north uh, and I didn't even have to come down on the Enterprise to Dublin this year. Uh, so I'm from just outside Belfast. Um, I have written a military, a light military space opera. So we fight with blasters and whatnot and uh, also some side paths. And I also primarily write uh, stories set in Northern Ireland. So we also have lots of street brawling and such like. Um, so that's that's who I am. Brilliant, cheers. Thank you, Joe. And Kat Dodd, if you'd like to tell us a little bit about yourself, please. Um, I'm Kat Dodd. I um, write, I can speak English. <laughs> I write sci fi fantasy, um, mostly also r r rural fantasy. <laughs> Sorry, I'm tripping over that word for some reason. <laughs> um, and while I can't think of anything I've done recently with fight scenes, I grew up writing Buffy the Vampire Slayer fanfic, and it's really hard to do that without knowing how to write fight scenes. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant. Cheers. Thank you very much, Kat. So, uh, yeah, we're, we have a couple of prepared questions that we're going to dive into now in a second, but I would um, urge anyone in the audience, if you do have any questions, queries, just anything at all you'd like this fantastic uh, panel of authors to answer, please don't hesitate to uh, drop your questions in the comments. And if we have time towards the end, we will do our best to get to them. So the first question up is how to write a realistic fight scene. What tips or techniques do you as a writer, uh, would, would you as a writer use to ensure realism in a fight scene? So I'm gonna open that up to the floor if there's anybody who'd like to dive into it. Otherwise I will pick someone. Um, Juliet? Well, I draw on 38 years of martial arts experience. Um, I started Please. studying a martial art called Aikido in 1983. I also did about 10 years of battery and acting and live role playing. Um, and so, that gives me uh, an awful lot of hands-on practical experience. Um, and the one thing I have learned that I can draw on a vast amount of experience and the more I put on the page, the less clear it becomes. Um, the Knowing what you're doing, knowing how these things work, if you're going to go into that level of detail is absolutely crucial. But when it comes to actually conveying it clearly to somebody who doesn't have that level of skill or expertise, uh, less is definitely more. 
makes sense absolutely um and uh, like coming from a background uh, julia where you kind of have studied this the, the martial arts for the last couple mm. of de- decades do you find that you are more inclined to kind of stay true to what you know in terms of like like uh, i suppose writing those scenes or would you take a little bit of creative liberties in order to kind of appease your readers or would you find some sort of a balance in between them um i'm i will stick to what i know works and what i know happens um yep. even if it's not necessarily what people think happens um you know real sword fights are incredibly short two yep. three strokes um the and you don't necessarily uh the way the injuries work um somebody can take a lethal uh penetrating wound to the abdomen and carry on fighting for at least half an hour before they drop dead um head injuries on the other hand any head injury that drops somebody unconscious is going to have lasting and serious consequences um and there's an awful lot of misunderstanding and misapprehension about that sort of detail which has been generated by film and tv and i don't the temptation to now here's what you don't know about (laughs) cockatoo injuries and concussion again not getting distracted by far too much detail but I do always want to make sure that it is accurate because you never know who's going to read it and if I read um, a fight scene that is inaccurate it will kill a book stone dead for me. Um, I was reading uh, a thriller who done it and um, a minute minuscule policewoman manages to restrain uh, a big ne'er-do-well and get the cuffs on him in a way that I'm thinking no I'm sorry she's going home in an ambulance um and I couldn't yeah okay that was the end of the book for me now the thing is that I have a degree of specialist knowledge that a lot of people won't have but even people who don't have a special level of specialist knowledge will get a sense if an author is fudging things um I on an on almost subconscious level. It's the same with science. I, I do not do the sciencey tech, but I can pick up when a hard SF writer is giving it the old handy wavy um, sort of explanations. But you don't necessarily have to have that degree of specialist knowledge to be able to write an effective fight scene. You just have to approach it in a different way. Yeah. I'll actually come in on that one because um, I, I, I'm I the biggest cowley in the world, as they say over here, um, and I have no specialist knowledge. And when I started writing the military sci-fi, um, I'm on a big sort of worldwide, uh, the, the sci-fi chronicles. And uh, one of the members there was a major in the US Army, and he wrote a thread where his uh, pent up frustrations all came out and he said, will you all please stop making up the military? If you don't know, ask me. So I so I approached this chap and I said, would you mind reading my military sci-fi? And he stayed on board for three full books, mm. advising me on the military, yes. reading only the military scenes. So he never actually saw how his scenes knitted into the book mm. until yeah. the very end and advising on not just the fight scenes, but also the way people were thinking and often, you know, brought around resolutions, you know, think places where I was stuck it was very black and white to him Mm. Um, so 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 I think it is really important you know as you say Juliet if you don't have it yourself instead of faking it just ask people love to talk people who know love to talk about (laughs) this stuff and they like it right yes so 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 I I actually find out they're a really really good relationship and we're still you know friends Mm. on Facebook and what point whatnot and at one point he had to get um clearance from the US Army to be a friend of the <laughs> from Northern Ireland and you never know what we're up to quite frankly. <laughs> so that was quite 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 good crack as well. Um but yeah good fun. That's, that's good yeah I think a lot of interesting points there um in particular if you're not sure of something um there's certainly people within your network or people that you can connect with who can kind of give you um that kind of additional layer of information um I, I come from like a, a military background well I did seven years in the reserve defense forces here in Ireland so I'd have an understanding of modern military stuff but um I suppose coming from Juliet's kind of thing like I wouldn't be really good when it comes to the sword the sword fighting or the kind of medieval type of weaponry so I'd have a 
colleague uh, called Lee Connolly, who's an author over in the UK, who is, is big into that over there. So I rely on him. So yeah, you're, you're, I think it's a fantastic point about networking and reaching out to people. So um, yeah, we'll dive into the next question then. Oh, sorry, did someone have a question? Oh, I was just, yeah. just going to say, like, I come from a fairly similar background from Juliet, where I, my dad was a black belt in judo. My mom was a brown belt in judo. My dad started teaching me judo when I was literally old enough to stand up without falling over. And so like just coming out from that 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 perspective you know the basics of how to stand and how to write from that um and like like with juliet was saying if you don't necessarily need to go into all this this detail unless the character would go into it like if the character would know the term osotogari that's pretty simple yeah. and also simple to explain of it's a leg sweep mm -hmm. you gotcha. don't need to go into the exacts of it you can just say a leg sweep um, and, and things like that. But I also grew up, do, grew up. I also did uh, stage fencing for a lar pretty large chunk of time, which is not the same as regular fencing. But mm -hmm. again, it gives you the basics of movements, patterns, what to watch for, because you need to make sure you're not going to actually stab somebody. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, um... Actually stabbing people is bad, even when you're using fake swords. Great. <laughs> and uh, just to add to that, I have in a far, far distant past, uh, I've also done uh, karate. So uh, I think everyone has done uh, martial arts at, in, at some point. You will. Uh, <laughs> um, yes, you have to. So, and um, yeah, you know, it does give you kind of like a basic understanding of how fights work. Um, but, you know, I tend to do a little bit of uh, Errol Flynn, um, you know, there are things like how it would work in reality, but I also think like, you know, you do want to introduce uh, set pieces, uh, make it look great and, you know, give something with a bit of oomph. Um, and, you know, aside from that, um, what I tend to do is also like, we have a lot of action figures in the house and I tend to use them to state yeah. things as well. Like, you know, how does this actually work? And because, you know, it is getting hard to, you know, keep uh, track of who is doing what to who and where people are positioned again towards each other. And then, uh, as Juliet said, like, you know, you have then the whole boring thing, uh, like a manual, and then you start stripping it back until it becomes something that is actually readable. Yeah. Yeah, I've been known to block out fight scenes at the start of martial arts classes. Um, and uh yeah you can get really good books absolutely that's uh, a particularly good one that i've found very useful it's fully illustrated and medieval sword fighting manuals are being reprinted um you know there is a lot of resources out there and also in the this day and age um youtube videos Absolutely. I mean, yeah. there's there's so many YouTube clips out there for all sorts of different martial arts and I suppose even firearms and how to kind of handle them and stuff for the more modern yeah, kind of I, battles. You know? I was um, writing a steampunk thing and needed to know how to unload a particular model of Webley revolver. Right. Found a genial gun enthusiast from America who was explaining, if you find this in your grandfather's sock drawer, yeah, but it it also uh, it depends on where the stress of your story lies, and yes. it, it's not always about the fight, uh, but it can be about what happens after. Uh, what I'm very interested in is what the violence does with with someone, what the effect is of a fight, and you know sometimes you end up going kind of like, do I need to write this whole scene, and you just end one chapter with. Uh, they rode towards the fight and then the next chapter they lost miserably. So yeah. Sometimes you write the fight scene by basically not writing it and only <laughs> write the effect of it, the outcome. Context is everything. Um, and mm. uh, you know, impact doesn't just mean fist on face. Mm -hmm. um, the emotional impact of a fight is you know, going to be crucial to your story. And that's actually one way that I'm in, I know a couple of writers who I won't name, who write extremely effective fight scenes with absolutely no technical knowledge whatsoever, because their focus is on the emotion of their point of view character. Mm -hmm. um, and so they, they're in terms of who's standing where and who's doing what, they absolutely 
uh, writing the barest detail, but their emphasis and their focus is on the fear, the rage, the um, desperation to leave, the determination to kill that bloke over there, or whatever is the, cr the crucial emotional impact of the fight for their story. That's what they focus on, and that can create a very, very effective fight scene. Absolutely, absolutely. That's a, a fantastic kind of point there, Juliet, and thanks for sharing that. So uh, that probably leads us into part of our next question there, is how much detail do you expect your readers to want or need? So Juliet, I know what you're saying about kind of like streaming or um, kind of not necessarily going overboard in terms of detail, but is there an expectation there for readers or a certain segment of readers who want that kind of um, word for word kind of breakdown of the scene, who want to feel every punch and kind of like uh, understand every kick in the position and stuff like that? Anyone want to take that? I think by the time it gets to a fight scene in a book, because, you know, you don't want to be starting with something like that because you're missing that whole emotional connection of anybody actually caring what happens to the, this character yep. um so i would hope by the time they got to that stage of my book they would realize that detail is not where it's going to be um you know because that links to your bigger wider writing style and, and you don't write fighting scenes as if they're a different entity they're they're part of that whole book and how it's knitted together mm -hmm. You know, and, and there's different audiences and that's fine. Um, you know, if you want pinprick detail, I'm not your writer. If you want emotional hits, I probably am. So I think, you know, it, it knits into the entire sort of style that you bring to the whole piece of work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, there's also, I'm sure, kind of changes genre by genre as well, you know, or depending on what the type of book it is and, and the, the characters themselves and what's unique to their journey. So um, it's definitely an interesting point in terms of the emotional side of stuff um, and like what, how a fight can kind of generate a better understanding of, of, of the character itself or of their kind of, of the overall plot. So uh, yeah, a lot of great points there. So next up then, what makes a gripping fight sequence? What would you as a writer do to build up an epic showdown, a one-on-one -on -one kind of combat situation? Uh, and this can be anything in terms of the, the build up to, you know, how to particular characters do get out. Um, is there anything in terms of your writing style, any kind of emphasis on the psychology or on the emotional state of the characters? And uh, Remco, would you like to take that first if you're comfortable? Uh, yes. Uh... Let me think. I, I think it comes down to, um, for me, it works to have a good uh, fighting scene introduced by uh, setting up the contrast. Um, you know, if you have um, a violent situation uh, happen right after a, you know, a nice, peaceful, quiet situation, you know, you already have more of a contrast. Um, I think what, what I also tend to do is uh, challenge myself by uh, raising the odds, um, you know, shifting the odds, like uh, don't make it too easy for your protagonist to win, uh, raising the stakes, like, you know, what happens uh, if, you know, your protagonist would lose, you know, what's at stake. Um, so, you know, that's in itself builds in a certain uh, expectation, uh, kind of like an uh, um, yeah, and focus uh, very much on uh, the effects of um, you know the fight as well, and that can be physical and definitely emotional. That's you know where it's at for us. Yeah, brilliant, makes sense. And uh, Joe, I wouldn't mind kind of getting uh, your insight in that, but uh, obviously you're coming from a place where you're kind of saying that you, you're not 100% or you haven't kind of done too much in terms of martial arts. So from that whole non-practical thing, what would you do to build up um, the emotional kind of gripping moment of a fight scene? What is it about your writing style that, you know, kind of hooks people in or kind of gets people excited about it? Yeah, so I mean, for me, it's first and foremost about the character and the situation mm -hmm. they're in and what they stand to lose. Um, and, and I think one of the challenges with fight scenes is not slowing it down to stop and tell everybody this year. So you really need to have the baseline, the foundation strongly in place before you hit into that fight scene. Um, and, and I suppose from there, it's, it's, it's a bit like, I think it was Remco was saying earlier, it's more about um the character's journey than it is how the exact blow happened so you know they think they're losing the panic the fear the festival sort of feelings um is more important to me than how exactly that blow happened 
Um, and and I think, you know, uh, you were saying earlier, Kat, about leg sweep, you know, you, sometimes not going into detail, but saying, you know, a heavy blow. Mm. Yeah. Enough to keep the reader with you if you're firmly in a point of view and firmly, you know, sort of building up those ratcheting emotions. Um, so I suppose with me, it's often more about the character than it is that external scene. And, you know, I get a lot of comments from my editor going, could we have some description, Joe? Any description? <laughs> Uh, you know, and actually at the end quite often is when I go back and end, add in all those little bits. I often have the first scene written and I have a little note at myself saying, add actions. <laughs> I literally stick a note of a line of, we'll write fight scene later. This is future cat's problem. Ha ha, <laughs> that's for you. Whereas yeah. I, I get feedback along the lines of, do we need all of this? <laughs> um, and the answer is almost all, invariably no. Um, I, I want to bring the reader into that fight and that is partly done with the technical accuracy and the detail which I don't go overboard on but um, the physicality the emotional but also the yeah the, the physicality of it um, the books I'm writing at the moment, the Green Man series, are contemporary and um, our hero Dan is six foot four and double XL and basically looks as if he can rip your arm off and club you to death with a soggy end, um, which actually means that if he gets into a fight he has to be extremely careful um, and at one point he finds himself facing off against a girl who's five foot nothing and eight stone dripping wet but she's got a knife and the issue there is if he lands a really heavy punch it is entirely possible that he could kill her and in the contemporary world you know basically yes it's an epic fantasy it's a, an urban fantasy rural fantasy contemporary fantasy book at which point he's in a world of grief and so that's the sort of thing that i focus on when i'm writing fight scenes is partly where you how people got there but where they're going afterwards, what is their victory conditions? How do they get out of that situation, either just alive or with what they need to achieve from this fight? Um, and the other instance where practical experience comes in handy is um, accidents on in dojos are extremely rare. But yeah, in 30 odd years of doing this, I have occasionally missed um, a step, not been fast enough with the block and got a hefty smack in the face. Um, at one point we were doing some staff work and I missed a block and I had to go in to work the following day oh, with a black no. eye and my glasses held together with sellotape, oh. uh, trying to explain that my husband had hit me around the head with a stick but it was an accident <laughs> and he did love me really um, <laughs> because we, we, we trained together um, but actually think experiences like that when you've had the shock of uh, something like that if you can convey that to a reader, you bring them really into the fight. Now, you don't necessarily have to have had those experiences yourself, but if you read biographies, autobiographies in particular, of people who have had dramatic, um, challenging lives, and so, yeah, they can be military, they can be adventurers, they can be explorers, they can be all sorts of people, and from all sorts of eras. Um, I've got a diary of a Napoleonic foot soldier somewhere. I've got uh, a memoir written by um, a Huguenot who was a galley slave during the French Revolution. Um, but again, read. If, if you don't have these experiences yourself, there's a wealth of resources out there that you can plunder other people's experiences. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite examples of how to establish your characters in a fight scene and drive up the tension is actually from Captain America and the Winter Soldier. Right. Because yeah. every time the Winter Soldier shows up, first we get to see the characters actually being really good at what they do. Mm -hmm. It's just the Winter Soldier is better. Right. So yeah. first we have Nick Fury like surviving things that really should have taken him out earlier. And then the winter soldier shows up and it's over in three seconds. Um, and like the same type of thing, thing with Steve, Steve, we get to see Steve fight and fight and fight and be really good. And then the winter soldier shows up and Natasha 
being a Natasha. <laughs> and then the Winter Soldier shows up. And it's, it's the opposite of the Worf treatment from Star Trek, where in order to establish how big of a threat they this person was, they'd take Worf out in a few seconds. And it meant that it actually made Worf look really, really bad at his job and super weak, instead of establishing these people yeah. as actual threats. Mm -hmm. Yeah, about uh, establishing, uh, I, I think that that's uh, something that I've definitely learned uh, to have to do, that you have to, before you start the fight, you have to really establish, you know, who's fighting. Uh, while, because while you're in the fight, you can't, um, you, you can't go like, oh yeah, that one, you know, with uh, the blonde hair and, you know, he's got a bit of a gummy leg and, you know, the eye, you know, you, you can't do that. So you have to really be able to very quickly pinpoint someone uh, while you're writing that scene. Um, Focusing on uh, establishing whose point of view you're writing from is yes. absolutely key. Yeah. Absolutely key. And, you know, and for point of view, uh, that's hooked into what Joe is saying. Like, you know, uh, it can be just a heavy blow. Uh, you don't always have to give uh, a lot of detail because fights can be messy when you are in a fight you half of the time you don't really know what's going on mm. so for, if you're your viewpoint character you can also be confused and just give the reader enough to not be too confused and go like i don't understand any of this let go <laughs> so you know it's it's kind of like tools you can play with and um you know keep it interesting for the reader and varied Yes, people who fall into the same pattern of describing fight scenes, uh, that soon becomes very noticeable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I actually find that harder <laughs> whenever you're doing, obviously, it's fantasy, it's science fiction, so we're not always actually trading physical blows, you know, there can be bolts of magic and whatever else going. And I actually find that they are the ones that tend to get more repetitive on me than fight scenes, because there's lots of different ways to hit someone, whereas with magic, there's often a way that the magic works. So mm -hmm. in, in my Avondale series, they have psych powers where, you know, sort of psych powers. And therefore, you know, I have to go through at the end and check how many times have I used the term psych or how many times have I used the word power. Um, and I actually find that those scenes can be harder to write in some ways because they're just that little bit less varied um, in terms of the attack. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm, I can believe that. Yeah, I, I think we've all been there. I know uh, from writing kind of... Um, military kind of scenes where there's a load of artillery strikes I found uh, in my first draft the word smashed several hundred times <laughs> everything was always like a, a shell smashed a grenade smashed you know this person smashed the floor you know everything so I uh, think as writers we, we've all been there Joe <laughs> I feel your pain so um, <laughs> that kind of leads into our next question a little bit so just in terms of point of views and um, what uh, like type of point of view works best for a fight scene uh, and what are the pros and cons and I suppose the, the to kind of frame this question a little bit better it's do you find like a fight scene can be more intense if it's from a first person so that this your character in particular is absorbing these hits is as Remco was saying is confused doesn't know what's going on uh, or is it more effective getting the kind of bird's eye view if it's a third uh, a third kind of person perspective and um, where you're looking at a company of kind of people or a battalion of soldiers beating and um, the living snot out of another battalion of soldiers so does anyone have any preferences in terms of point of views for writing a fight scene I think it depends on the goal of the scene itself. Because you're not going to write every fight scene the same way. Yeah, very true. I would I would make a distinction between a fight scene, which is a personal combat, yeah. and a battle scene. Yeah, um, fair point, Julia. Where, fair point. And now a, a personal combat can be one-on-one, -on -one, it can be a barroom brawl, or it can be two people squaring off against each other in a battle line. But a, a, a fight, and you know, I, I have been in a shield wall. I have done um, battle, battlefield reenactments. Um, and when you are fighting one on one, and you, you are only uh, solely focused on the person immediately in front of you who is trying to kill you. Um, writing a battle, be that um, knights on horseback or whatever, or spaceships or tanks or whatever that's a very different thing of writing um and i ended up writing battles in the lescari revolution series um the volume with all the battles in unsurprisingly is called blood in the water 
Um, and what I did there, um, because it's about a revolution, so there were going to be battles, and my husband and I actually wargamed them. Um, but so on one of them, I've got I'm you have to ring the changes because it's going to get very dull. So I've got you know poor bloody infantry in one of them. I've got uh, a guy who's part of the cavalry who is charging in to uh, break up the um, foot soldiers fighting in another battle. In another one, I've got a guy who is a galloper for the commanding officers. So he has actually got almost you know the, the bird's eye view of the battlefield. But what he doesn't know is where his friends are and what's happening to them. Um, so yeah, battle, battle scenes and fight scenes, I think, are extremely different and require a very different set of skills to write well. Also, you, you know, picking up on, on what you were saying there, Juliet, some of it is about choosing the right point of view. So mm. I don't think it's about whether you're in close third or whether you're in first. I think that tends to be said, I've just finished my first novel in first person, present, which was out of the blue because I normally write third person past. Um, it didn't actually make any difference in terms of the character experience because you write closely but you know it's about saying to yourself do I choose the person who's fighting and therefore limit myself as Remco is saying a fight comes at you very fast mm. you're not taking in anything else that's around you you're just taking in that you've been thumped and you're a bit dazed and all this here or do I move that to an observer um who is able to be a little bit apart and maybe put in bits of the exposition that are needed or do you take it to the commander who's got the overview so you know and, and i'm sure i'm not the only one who's written a scene sometimes from a couple of different point of views to figure out which one is actually the right and the strongest for that scene um you know and, and there's also an argument if you don't do it too often that you can shift a uh, point of view you know in, in from the combat and to the commander but you know it, it's it's how you do that and how smoothly you do it there's um one of joe abercrombie's books and i cannot remember the title um which irritates me but um you know one of the things that you know creative writing 101 no head hopping um yeah. that if you are working with a point of view you need to be consistent and all that and joe absolutely shatters that because he effectively does um, crosses a battlefield, going from the one fight to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. And these are all um, Star Trek red shirts, if you like. They're not people who are crucial to the story. But he conveys the um, intensity of the battle and um, the battle the fact that yes the battle has great grave implications for the huge political big picture but in bringing it to what you see in these snapshots of people's lives as they are affected on the battlefield um is an extraordinarily effective piece of writing um so you know you have to be inventive and creative i think um yeah in as you can yeah, and a brilliant points, and I'll definitely have to check that out, Juliet. Uh, I'd love to kind of read up on that a little I'll bit more. I'll have to try and so. find which <laughs> Yeah, if, if you come across, do <laughs> let me know. There are Crombie fans out there that can help out. Uh, yeah, do, do. Uh, put it in the comments here, in. let us know. Save us, save us a bunch of effort. Yeah. So, uh, folks, I just want to flag that we've got a few minutes left on this panel, so I wouldn't mind just diving into some of the questions from the audiences, or from the audience. So the first question we have is from T. John Stowe, 92, on Twitch, and he asks, or he or she, or they, uh, what sort of weapon or fighting style has have you found it easiest to write for and what type have you had the most difficulty with so does anyone have any stories about um a particular weapon or fighting style that you've struggled with or had difficulty with i struggle with archery because it's so repetitive it's very so repetitive it's yeah archery is tricky if you don't do it fortunately i have a good friend who's an archer um who has connections you, you give technical advice yeah archery is definitely a challenge yeah. if you don't do it and i don't and, and the people who know it they know it Ooh. they know when you're making it up oh yes i, I think don't for me yeah for me uh swords um it's the thing that's easiest but also the most difficult because of the amount of sword fighting you, uh, everyone has seen on television, film, etc. So when you have your character fighting with a sword, it's so easy 
to forget, you know, they're not in a contest, you know, they can fight dirty and, you know, my heroes, they shoot. So, um, so, you know, I have to keep reminding myself to break the rules as well. So there you go. Linton, okay. Uh, the next question we have is, do you ever get to a point where you need to break the realism to raise another aspect like the tension, i.e. space domain battles that would never occur in visual range, but are often portrayed as such for dramatic effect? I, I, Does anyone want to approach that? I, I find when I'm writing the Northern Irish stuff, um, it's definitely a bit of Northern Irish humour that nobody else recognises as humour. Everybody always <laughs> thinks there's no humour in my books and there's plenty. Um, but actually breaking that tension with a little bit of humour or a little bit of, you know, a little dash of something else um, definitely keeps, I, I think it keeps the attention. It's a bit like what you were saying, Kat, about the repetitiveness sometimes in a fight scene, that if you can just take that little quick snapshot, that little aside, and Joe Abercrombie does that really well as well, mm. um, just keeps that scene active and going. Um, and I think especially if it's a long sort of running battle along corridors upon corridors upon corridors, then you really do need to be inserting something to just keep that scene moving and active. And I don't think humor in that situation is actually unrealistic because Gallo's humor is so common. Read any military memoir. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true. Yeah. <laughs> very true. Uh, so we have uh, roughly four more minutes left. So we'll just dive into the very last question. Would you agree that the story of a fight scene is as or more important as a technical aspect? Anyone would like to take that? Yeah, context is everything. Absolutely. Um, and the only point of having a fight is because it you have to have a fight. If it doesn't matter, it doesn't count. Mm -hmm. It's a waste of words. There have got to, you know you've got to have high stakes, which don't necessarily have to be life or death. Yeah, you have, you have it, it just needs to be high to the character. Yeah. 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 No, it it definitely I agree with that. Uh, you know, violence is meaningless if it's uh, if it doesn't have consequences. And indeed, you know, that can be any sort of consequences. Mm. Um, but, you know, if they're not there, then you're just doing it for, you know, to, to show off and go like to be cool. And, <laughs> you know, it's it's empty. So don't do it. And I, and I think we, we really need to actually care about the outcome. And that's, yeah. that's partly about the stakes, but it's also a lot to the character. And whether or not people yep. are rooting for them. Um, and, and, and Remco mentioned it earlier about consequences afterwards. You know, Definitely. People, yeah, they don't walk away, you know, afterwards, like and, and so many heroes in fantasy, you know, they get awful things done to them and they're fine. It's like <laughs> happened. That's not the reality. So I think that focus on who's in the fight and what they're fighting for and keeping it at the front of your thoughts is yeah. important. Absolutely. Brilliant. That's solid advice. So folks, uh, we're coming up to the two minute marker now before the panel ends. So I wouldn't mind just uh, going around uh, the magic roundabout again, if everyone would just uh, like to maybe uh, take a minute or two to uh, give us a couple of lines about yourself, about your work, if any exciting news to come up in terms of any new books, or if you're making any appearances or anything at all that you'd like to share with the audience before we finish up in the next two minutes. So again, we'll go around the circle. Remco, if you'd like to fire away there. Uh, yes, I already mentioned the uh, story that will uh, appear in the collection uh, from Flame Tree Press. It's called, uh, the collection is called uh, Beyond the Veil. Uh, Juliet, if you'd like to tell us a little um, bit about your I'm latest, latest a release. I've a lot of exciting things at the moment, which I can't tell you about because none of it's been announced. <laughs> <laughs> um, but at, I think it's 12 o'clock tomorrow, I should be reading um, some pieces from uh, the Green Man books. Uh, the new one, The Green Man's Challenge. Brilliant. Cheers. Thank you very much, uh, Julia. And Joe, if you'd like to fire away with any exciting news or hot gossip that you can tell exclusively here at the <laughs> Octagon panels that nowhere else can find out first. Well, I've got a book coming out, which I kind of forgot to mention earlier. It's coming out at the end of November this time. I've gone down south to Christ the South instead of the north. And I'm in lovely Glen Bay in Donegal uh, with okay. a wild furry hunt uh, going through the estate at Christmas. Um, so that comes out from Inspired Quills Publishers at the end of November, all being well. And then next year I have a 
climate change dystopia set in Northern Ireland. Anyone from Northern Ireland or even Ireland tuning in, it is the first ever Kalibaki, Kalibaki dystopia, uh, which I think the world's been waiting for. Um, and that one's I'm going to self-publish as I did Anish Carrick. Um, I quite like having the freedom to do what I like with the Northern Irish themes I write. Um, and then I'm supposed to be writing the sequel to Anish Carrick too, and we'll just whistle on that one. Well done. Look forward to that. Fair play. Uh, and Cal, if you'd like to bring it off there, tell us a yeah. bit of news or something exciting. Um, um, so my writing group, Cup on Bay, uh, launched its sixth anthology this weekend at Octopon. Uh, it is a hope punk anthology entitled Fierce. Um, I am biased, but I think it's really good. It's one of our smallest because we started it on a whim, really. <laughs> Okay. Uh, so it, it has the, the least authors so far, but um, all of this, like, again, I'm biased, but I think all of the stories are pretty top notch. So there you have it, folks. There's loads of fantastic books on sale there. I think there's some Octagon merch as well in the dealer's room as well. So do make sure that you uh, hop in there and pick up some fantastic deals. Uh, I would like to say thank you to everyone who came and viewed the, the panel. And thank you very much to my fellow panelists. It's been an absolute fantastic one. Um, so thank you very much, everyone, for your time. We've had a fantastic show and look we'll leave it there everyone enjoy your octacon and once again a huge thank you to the entire octacon team cheers thanks very much folks it's been a pleasure thank you, thank you. bye, bye.